Have you ever wondered, how hell looks like in every religion and the afterlife in ancient mythology? Christianity In Christian theology, hell is the place or state into which, by God's definitive judgment, unrepentant sinners pass in the general judgment, or, as some Christians believe, immediately after death. Its character is inferred from teaching in the biblical texts, some of which, interpreted literally, have given rise to the popular idea of hell. Theologians today generally see hell as the logical consequence of rejecting union with God and with God's justice and mercy. Eastern Orthodox Views Some Eastern Orthodox Christians interpret heaven and hell as experiences of God's just and loving presence, rather than physical places. They believe there is no created realm devoid of God, and hell isn't a complete separation from God in essence. Instead, both are seen as dimensions of God's presence, with the experience being either torment or paradise based on a person's spiritual condition in relation to God. Some Eastern Orthodox theologians, like Archimandrite Sophrony, do describe hell as a form of separation from God, in terms of being outside of fellowship or loving communion. They emphasize that hell is essentially the state of being apart from God and unable to feel His love, while being fully conscious of this deprivation as a form of punishment. They assert that it is humanity, through its rejection of God's love in favor of worldly pursuits, that creates hell, not God. This perspective underscores that our life circumstances, choices, and relationships ultimately revolve around our eternal connection or disconnection from God. Protestantism In historic Protestant traditions, hell is considered the place created by God for the punishment of the devil, fallen angels, and those not listed in the Book of Life. It serves as the ultimate destination for those who do not attain salvation, where they will face retribution for their sins. Hell awaits individuals after the final judgment. The differences in how various Protestant denominations perceive hell in connection to concepts like Hades, the abode of the dead, and Gehenna, the destination for the wicked, stem from their varying beliefs about the state between death and resurrection, as well as differing opinions on the immortality of the soul or conditional immortality. For instance, John Calvin, who believed in conscious existence after death, held a distinct concept of hell compared to Martin Luther, who viewed death as a form of slumber. Christian Universalism Embraced by some with Protestant leanings like George MacDonald, Karl Barth, and others, posits that after a period in Gehenna, all souls are ultimately reconciled with God and granted entry into heaven. Some believe that through various means, all souls are drawn to repentance at the time of death, sparing them from hellish suffering. This perspective, also known as Biblical or Trinitarian Universalism, in its conservative form, is distinct from Unitarian Universalism. While a minority viewpoint in contemporary Western Christianity, it has historical roots and was once a prevalent belief. Christian Universalism asserts that the concept of an eternal hell is a later construct of the Church lacking Biblical support. Proponents argue that it contradicts the nature of a loving God, human nature, the destructive aspect of sin, the essence of holiness and happiness, as well as the purpose of punishment. Thomas Talbot, a notable advocate of Trinitarian Universalism, presents three mutually exclusive propositions based on biblical interpretation. These are, 1. God is all-powerful and governs all aspects of human existence. 2. God is all-loving, characterized by ontological love, and desires the salvation of all individuals. 3. Some individuals will endure eternal, conscious suffering in a place of either literal or metaphorical fire. Traditional theology resolves this contradiction by redefining concepts like omnipotence or omnibenevolence. Universalists reject the third proposition, contending that all individuals receive salvation. Gnosticism Many Gnostic Christians, such as the Cathars, interpreted hell as a metaphor for this flawed, material world in which human souls have become entrapped. 
Later writers influenced by the Gnostic worldview, such as Milton and Blake, interpreted it differently. In The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, William Blake is read by certain scholars as implying that hell is similar to heaven, or even preferable to it in terms of being a state in which creative impulses are allowed free reign outside the domination of society, which prefers the limitations of heaven. Jehovah's Witnesses Jehovah's Witnesses reject the concept of an immortal soul after death. They interpret hell, translated from Sheol and Hades, as a common grave for both good and bad individuals, and they do not believe in a literal, eternally painful place, considering it incompatible with God's love and justice. They understand Gehenna as representing eternal destruction or the second death, reserved for those without the chance of resurrection, such as those destroyed at Armageddon. According to Jehovah's Witnesses, individuals who died prior to Armageddon will be bodily resurrected on earth and judged during Christ's 1,000-year rule based on their obedience to God's laws after resurrection. Latter-day Saints The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints teaches a nuanced understanding of hell. They believe it has two meanings in Scripture. The first is spirit prison, a temporary state of punishment for those who reject Christ, where they have an opportunity to learn the gospel and repent. Christ is believed to have visited this place after his crucifixion to commence the work of salvation for the deceased. Righteous individuals will experience a first resurrection and dwell with Christ on earth. After a 1,000-year period called the Millennium, those in spirit prison who did not accept the gospel will also be resurrected in what is called the second resurrection. At these times, death and hell will release the dead for judgment based on their deeds. Most will receive varying degrees of glory. The LDS Church interprets biblical descriptions of hell as eternal or endless punishment to mean it is inflicted by God, rather than a never-ending temporal period. Additionally, they believe in a more permanent concept of hell called outer darkness. This is reserved for very few, including Cain, and for those who commit the unpardonable sin, essentially denying Jesus Christ after full knowledge. It's emphasized that most people lack the level of religious understanding needed to commit this sin. The majority of those in outer darkness will be Lucifer's followers from the pre-mortal existence. It remains uncertain whether those in outer darkness can ultimately be redeemed. According to LDS scripture, the specifics of their condition are not revealed except to those who experience it. They will, however, be aware of its duration and limitations. Seventh-day Adventist Church The Seventh-day Adventist Church rejects the idea of eternal suffering, deeming it inconsistent with God's nature. Instead, they believe that hell signifies eternal death, a state of unconsciousness until resurrection. They draw support from biblical passages like Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5, the dead know nothing, and 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13, describing the dead rising at the second coming, asserting that these verses imply a state akin to sleep. According to their interpretation of verses like Matthew 16 verse 27 and Romans 6 verse 23, the unsaved do not face immediate punishment upon death but remain in the grave until a future judgment after Jesus' return, where they will be judged for either eternal life or eternal death. This perspective is termed annihilationism. Seventh-day Adventists also assert that hell is not an everlasting place, contending that descriptions of it as eternal or unquenchable do not imply a fire that never extinguishes. They refer to examples like the eternal fire in Jude 1 verse 7, which was sent as punishment to Sodom and Gomorrah but eventually went out. Islam Jehannam or hell is a place made by Allah to punish evildoers in the afterlife. The concept of levels in Jehannam is based on the weight of the sins committed by the sinner. Muslims believe that there are seven levels of hell, just like seven levels of heaven. These are also referred to as the gates to hell and are associated with different kinds of punishments that are both physical and spiritual in nature. 
It is believed that in the afterlife no one dies and when the human is burned to ashes in hell, they will be returned to the healthy form and will be punished in the same way again. This cycle will go on until Allah forgives them. The concept of hell in Islam. It is believed that hell is an ever flaming pit of fire. The fire in hell is of the highest heat and is black in color. Hell is the place from which every human is warned and is told to refrain from sins. The punishment in hell is endless for non-believers and backbiters, while for Muslims the punishment depends on the sins committed by them. Levels of Hell Hell is divided into seven levels that are situated below each other based on the gravity of the sinners. The temperature and the severity of the punishment keeps increasing as one descends through the levels. Each level is made for different types of sinners and punishments. Jahannam, or the first level of hell, this level is for Muslims who were sinful in the world. It has the least heat among all the levels and has the least painful punishment for the sinners. As the sinners enter through its gates their faces will be burned and the fire will eat their flesh. Here Allah will renew their flesh every time after they are burned. Lada This level is situated below Jahannam, and it is for people who did not believe in Allah, rejected the Prophet's messages and did not believe in them as the messengers of Allah. The main punishment in this level is that fire will eat away one's organs one by one both externally and internally, and will finally destroy their body. Sakr The punishment for the people here is that fire will eat up their flesh but not bones. The four reasons for which people land up in this level of hell are. They did not perform prayer or offer food to the poor. They used to talk vainly with those who talk in vain. They refused the existence of the day of reward and resurrection. al hutama In this level, situated below Sakr, it is believed that the fire here will burn the sinners to the bones and emblaze their heart and inner organs. The fire will start from their feet and then go up to their heart. It is believed that the sinners will cry to the point where their tear glands will dry out, the blood will dry out, and their tears will be of the huge amount that even if a ship was to be sailed in the pool of their tears it will do so easily. Jehim It is believed that it lies below al hutama which is a big piece of coal and is bigger than the lowest level. Sinners will be thrown here for three reasons. They did not give correct belief to Allah. Declined to give the correct right to the creations. Did not encourage feeding the poor. Seer this level of hell is situated below Jehim. This level has been kindling since it was made. It consists of 300 castles which have 300 huts each in which there are 300 rooms each and, in each room, there are 300 different types of penalties. The pain here is unimaginable, unbearable and it is very painful. Here there are scorpions, snakes, chain, ropes and whatnot. Also, it has a pit of agony which is the most painful punishment in the whole hell. al hawiya This is the last and the worst level of hell. It is said that no sinner will be released from this level. There is pitch darkness on this level. Backbiters and non-believers are punished here. The sinners in this level will be crushed under mountains with them lying on their faces, the hands of the sinners will be bound to their necks and their necks to their legs. The Quran says that al hawiya is the level in which kindled fire will embrace the sinner as a mother embraces her son. The concept of hell as well as the gates of hell or the levels of Jahannam are described in quite detail in the, the Quran and it warns Muslims to stay away to sins identified in Islam. Asking Allah for forgiveness and repentance in Islam is the way to expiate for sins and stay blessed. Hinduism Naraka, also called Yamaloka, is the Hindu equivalent of hell, where sinners are tormented after death. It is also the residence of Yama, the god of death. It is described as located in the south of the universe and beneath the earth. The number and names of hells, as well as the type of sinners sent to a particular hell, varies from text to text, however, many scriptures describe 28 hells. After death, Messengers of Yama called Yamadudas bring all beings to the court of Yama, 
where he weighs the virtues and the vices of the being and passes a judgment, sending the virtuous to Svarga, heaven, and the sinners to one of the hells. The stay in Svarga or Naraka is generally described as temporary. After the quantum of punishment is over, the souls are reborn as lower or higher beings as per their merits. Early texts like the Rigveda do not have a detailed description of Naraka. The Shatapatha Brahmana is the first text to mention the pain and suffering of Naraka in detail, while the Manu Smurti begins naming the multiple hells. The epics also describe hell in general terms as a dense jungle without shade, where there is no water and no rest. The Yamadudas torment souls on the orders of their master. The names of many of hells is common in Hindu texts, however, the nature of sinners tormented in particular hells varies from text to text. The summary of 28 hells described in the Bhagavata Purana and the Devi Bhagavata Purana are as follows. 1. Tamisra, darkness. Sin, stealing others' wealth, wife, or children. Punishment, bound, starved, beaten, and reproached by Yamadudas. 2. And Hatamisra, blind darkness. Sin, deceiving and enjoying another's wife or children. Punishment, loses intelligence and sight, likened to cutting a tree's roots. 3. Rorava, fearful or hell of Rurus. Sin, hurting others while caring for oneself and family, being envious. Punishment, tortured by serpent-like beasts, Rurus, created by harmed beings. 4. Maharorava, great fearful. Sin, indulging at the expense of others. Punishment, afflicted with pain by fierce Rurus, Kraviyadas, who eat flesh. 5. Come Hippica, cooked in a pot. Sin, cooking animals alive. Punishment, cooked alive in boiling oil by Yamadudas for as many years as the number of hairs on the victims. 6. Kalasutra, threat of time slash death. Sin, murdering a Brahmin, disrespecting parents, elders, ancestors, or Brahmins. Punishment, burns from within by hunger and thirst in a hot, copper realm. 7. Asipatravana slash Asipatrakanana, forest of sword leaves. Sin, digressing from religious teachings, wanton tree felling. Punishment, beaten with whips, chased in a forest with sword-like leaves. 8. Shukramukha, hog's mouth. Sin, punishing the innocent or Brahmins. Punishment, crushed like sugar cane, experiences intense agony. 9. And Hakapa, well with its mouth hidden. Sin, harming others maliciously, including insects. Punishment, attacked by various creatures, deprived of rest. 10. Krimabhajana slash Krimabhaksha, worm food. Sin, selfishly eating without sharing with guests, not performing yajnas. Punishment, reduced to a worm, consumed by others for 100,000 years. 11. Sandansa slash Sandamsa, hell of pincers. Sin, robbing, stealing when not in dire need, violating vows or rules. Punishment, torn by red-hot iron balls and tongs. 12. Taptasurmi slash Taptamurti, red-hot iron statue. Sin, illicit sexual relations. Punishment, beaten, forced to embrace red-hot iron figurines. 13. Vajra Kantakasalmali, the silk cotton tree with thorns like thunderbolts slash vitras. Sin, having intercourse with non-humans or excessive coitus. Punishment, tied to a thorny tree, pulled by Yamadudas. 14. Vitarni slash Vitarna, to be crossed. Sin, neglecting duty, born in a respectable family, royal family, or government official. Punishment, consumed by fierce aquatic beings in a river of filth. 15. Quyota, water of pus. Sin, living without cleanliness and good behavior. Punishment, forced to eat repugnant substances. 16. Pranaroda, obstruction to life. Sin, 
indulging in hunting and wanton killing of beasts. Punishment, targeted in archery sport by Yamadudas. 17. Visashana, murderous. Sin, sacrificing beasts as a status symbol. Punishment, whipped, eventually killed by Yamadudas. 18. Lalabhaksa, saliva as food. Sin, forcing wife to drink semen. Punishment, thrown into a river of semen, forced to drink. 19. Saramayadana, hell of the sons of Saramo. Sin, plundering, mass murder, ruining the nation. Punishment, preyed upon by ferocious dogs. 20. Avicii slash Avisimat, waterless slash waveless. Sin, lying on oath or in business. Punishment, repeatedly thrown from a high mountain, body continuously broken. 21. Ayapana, iron drink. Sin, drinking alcohol, for Brahmins under oath. Punishment, forced to drink molten iron. 22. Xarakardama, acidic slash saline mud slash filth. Sin, not honoring a person higher in various respects. Punishment, thrown head first and tormented. 23. Raksagana Bojana, food of Rakshasas. Sin, practicing human sacrifice and cannibalism. Punishment, cut and feasted upon by Rakshasas. 24. Shula Prota, pierced by sharp pointed spear slash dart. Sin, harassing birds, animals, or humans with sharp objects. Punishment, pierced with sharp spears, flesh torn by carnivorous birds. 25. Dandasukha, snakes. Sin, harming others with envy and fury. Punishment, devoured by hooded serpents. 26. Avadaniradana, confined in a hole. Sin, imprisoning others in dark places. Punishment, engulfed in a dark well with poisonous fumes. 27. Periyavartana, returning. Sin, welcoming guests with cruelty and abuse. Punishment, eyes plucked by birds. 28. Susamukha, needle face. Sin, ever suspicious, proud of wealth. Punishment, thread stitched through entire body. Buddhism Buddhism teaches that there are six realms of existence, one of which is a realm that acts like hell. Naraka, often called hell or purgatory in English, is a concept in Buddhist cosmology. It differs from Christian hell in that beings are not sent there as divine punishment, and their stay is not eternal, but incredibly long. Beings are born into a Naraka based on their accumulated karma, residing there until that karma reaches its full effect. Afterward, they are reborn in higher realms due to unripened karma. Narakas are depicted as cavernous layers beneath the human world. They are categorized into eight cold Narakas and eight hot Narakas. Here's a summary of each. Hot Narakas Sanjeeva, reviving. The ground of this Naraka is made of hot iron heated by an immense fire. Beings appear fully grown, in a state of fear and misery. They experience various tortures, including attacks by their fellows and hell guards. Kalasutra, Black Thread Along with the torments of Sanjeeva, black lines are drawn on the body, which hell guards use as guides to cut beings with fiery saws and axes. Sada, Crushing Surrounded by massive rocks that crush beings into a bloody pulp, life is restored once the rocks move apart. Rorava, screaming. In this Naraka, beings run wildly, seeking refuge from the burning ground. Once they find apparent shelter, they are locked inside as it blazes around them. Maharorava, great screaming. Similar to Rorava, this Naraka is reserved for those who sustain their own bodies by harming others. Ruru animals called Kravayata torment them and consume their flesh. Tapana, heating. 
Hell guards impale beings on fiery spears until flames issue from their noses and mouths. Pratapana, Great Heating The tortures here are akin to Tapana, but beings are pierced more violently with a trident. Life in this Naraka lasts for an extremely long duration. Avicii, Uninterrupted Beings are roasted in an immense blazing oven, enduring intense suffering. Life in Avicii is said to last an incomprehensible length of time. Cold Narakas Our Buddha, Blister This Naraka is a dark, frozen plain surrounded by icy mountains, swept by blizzards. Inhabitants arise fully grown, naked and alone, enduring lifelong exposure to extreme cold, which causes blisters on their bodies. Nirar Buddha, Burst Blister even colder than our Buddha, this Naraka features blisters that burst open, leaving the being's bodies covered in frozen blood and pus. Atada, shivering. Here, beings continuously shiver in the cold, producing a shivering sound with their mouths. Hahava, lamentation. Inhabitants of Hahava lament in the cold, emitting sounds of pain. Huhova, chattering teeth. Beings in this Naraka shiver to the point where their teeth chatter, making a chattering sound. Utpol, Blue Lotus The intense cold in Utpol causes the skin to turn blue, resembling the color of a blue lotus flower. Padma, Lotus This Naraka is characterized by blizzards that crack open frozen skin, leaving individuals raw and bloody. Mahapadma, Great Lotus in this Naraka, the entire body cracks into pieces, exposing internal organs to the extreme cold. The lifetimes in each Naraka increase in length by a factor of 8 compared to the previous one. Some sources describe hundreds of thousands of different Narakas. Despite its reputation among many people in the West as being a peaceable religion and one lacking gods or an afterlife, this conception of hell portrayed by certain strands of Buddhism is an undeniable place of torment and suffering, yet it is a temporary one, with every rebirth eventually leading back to the deceased becoming human again. No divine being or presence decides on this, only actions or attitudes do. However, time spent in this hell, although temporary, can still last for millions of years. Judaism In Judaism, the concept of hell is not as central or standardized as it is in some other religious traditions like Christianity or Islam. Instead, there are different understandings and interpretations within Jewish thought. In certain esoteric Jewish traditions, particularly those associated with Kabbalah and certain mystical writings, there are references to a hierarchy of hells. Here are the seven hells in Judaism. Sheol Sheol is often understood as a neutral place where both the righteous and the wicked go after death. It's not a place of active punishment or reward. Instead, it's akin to a shadowy underworld, where souls exist in a state of separation from the living. Abaddon This is associated with chaos and destruction. Souls in Abaddon may experience a sense of upheaval and turmoil, representing the consequences of negative actions or spiritual unrest. Bir Shahat This is sometimes referred to as the pit of corruption. Souls in Bir Shahat are believed to undergo a process of purification through suffering. The suffering is meant to cleanse them of their impurities and negative tendencies. Tit Hayon this realm is often described as a mud pit of murk. It's associated with spiritual degradation and impurity. Souls in Tit Hayon may be stuck in mire and filth, representing a state of spiritual decline. Shar Ma'at This translates to the gates of death. It's often seen as a place where souls confront the reality of death and face the consequences of their actions in life. This may involve a period of reflection and atonement. Shar Zalmawet This is sometimes referred to as the gloomy gates of death. It's associated with a deeper level of spiritual impurity and is seen as a place of judgment and retribution. 
souls here may face more severe consequences for their negative actions. Gehenna Gehenna is often associated with a realm of punishment and purification. It's not eternal, and souls are believed to eventually be purified and move on to a better state. The suffering in Gehenna is understood as a means of purging the soul of its impurities and preparing it for a higher spiritual existence. Egypt Death, for the ancient Egyptians, meant a lot more than just mummies and pyramids. The Egyptians had a terrifying vision of what awaited them after death. The souls of dead Egyptians didn't just drift on to eternity, they had to fight for it, after death, the Egyptians had to battle their way through the twelve lands of hell. They had to pass through rings of fire, sneak past gods, and hide from serpents and crocodiles that would try to devour their souls. It was a brutal, horrific journey, and it was a lot more exciting than your history teacher let on. Fighting Through the Twelve Lands of Hell Like most religions, the Egyptian faith promised a land of eternal paradise. They called it Aru, the field of reeds, where endless crops grew in an unceasing abundance. Getting to Aru, though, wasn't exactly easy. To make it in, you'd have to battle your way through a place they called Duit. The Egyptians had the whole afterworld mapped out, literally. They had maps of Duit, showing it as a land divided into two paths by a lake of flames that consumed the souls of the damned. The biggest threats, though, were the creatures that lived there. The land was filled with gods, demons, and monsters, most of which would annihilate the eternal soul of anyone who tried to pass through their domains. As the dead traveled through Duit, they would be pursued by serpents and crocodiles that would try to devour their souls. If they wanted eternal life, they'd have to get past them all. If they failed, they would suffer through an eternity of oblivion. The dead had to make it through before their bodies decayed. There was a reason the Egyptians mummified their dead. The souls of the dead, they believed, needed their bodies while they fought their way through Duet. A decaying body was a ticking clock. If their bodies decayed before they reached paradise, they would run out of time. The soul, the Egyptians believed, split into two parts at death, the personality, which they called the Ba, and the vital essence, which they called the Ka. It was their vital essence that traveled up into Duet, fighting for a chance at paradise. If it made it through, the two parts of the soul would be reunited and live forever, but only if the Ka could make it in time. The Ba would spend the day flying around the world. At night, though, it needed to return to the body to rejuvenate its energy, and it could only return to the body if it could recognize it. If the body decayed into a skeleton, the Ba would drift about aimlessly, unable to find the other part of its soul, until its energy ran out. The pharaohs bought time by getting mummified, ensuring that their souls would always be able to recognize their own bodies. For the poor, though, that wasn't always an option. Their best hope was to be buried in a shallow grave in the desert, where the dry air would slow the decay of their bodies, and to rush through Duet's twelve lands as fast as they could. The dead still needed to eat. Even after death, an Egyptian soul still needed to eat. They needed to pack food for their long journeys through Duet, and they needed to make sure they could eat it, and that meant somebody needed to stuff food into them. After the body of the dead was mummified, the Egyptian priests would start a ritual called the opening of the mouth and the eyes. This was meant to ensure that the spirit could be given food and drink as well as see. To feed it, they'd build a statue in the dead person's likeness. Then, they would chip mouth and eye holes into the statue. Until the soul made it through do it, the priests would have to feed it, and that meant literally stuffing beef into the statue's mouth. It was more than just a ritual, it was a matter between eternal life and death. If you didn't have someone who cared enough about you to stuff beef into a statue's mouth, your shot at eternal life was doomed. Your soul would starve and do it, your eyes would be sealed shut, and you would have no chance of making it past the twelve gates of hell. 
traveling to space in a pyramid. The soul, once released, still needed to find its way into the netherworld. Duet, the ancient Egyptians believed, was in the sky, and if you weren't buried in a massive pyramid, it was nearly impossible to reach it. Pyramids, in early Egyptian culture, were probably built to transport the soul into outer space. The Egyptians believed that the small, dark spot in the night sky around which the stars appeared to revolve was the gateway to do it. They would build shafts extending out of their pyramids, pointed directly at that small space, meant to launch the dead pharaoh's soul up and into the domain of the gods. That wasn't exactly an option for people who weren't pharaohs, which was probably on purpose. The Egyptians only built pyramids in the earlier days of the empire, and at the time, people were told that the only person who was allowed an afterlife was the pharaoh. Later on, they opened up the afterlife to everyone else, but when the pyramids were built, they were seen as the only shot any living person had at a second life. Everyone else on earth, they believed, was fated to simply cease to exist. Servants would be killed with the pharaoh. The pharaoh wouldn't go to the afterlife alone. He took people with him, by murdering them. A dying pharaoh expected to enjoy all the comforts of life in the afterlife. That meant having his servants, his artists, and everyone dear to him at his side. They'd be brought into the pharaoh's tomb on the day of his death and poisoned. Sometimes, that even included animals. In fact, one pharaoh was buried with seven lions to accompany him on his journey to the afterlife. Some of them went wild with this idea. The most extreme was a pharaoh named Jur, who poisoned 569 people so that he could take them with him to the other side. Another pharaoh named Aha only took a few dozen people with him, but he made sure that one of them was his five-year-old son. By the pharaoh's orders, the young boy was poisoned and buried before he would ever have the chance to grow up. Threatening the gods to get into heaven. A great body of water, the Egyptians believed, separated the sky from the earth. To get in to do it, they would have to cross it, and the only way across was to convince the ferrymen of the gods to take you. That's not an altogether unique idea about the afterlife, but the Egyptians handled their ferrymen a bit differently than the Greeks did. They didn't pay him a toll or treat him with the type of reverence you'd expect someone to offer the being responsible for the fate of their immortal souls. They'd just yell at him. Egyptian priests would chant prayers to the ferryman, first assuring him that no person accused the dead soul of misdeed and then begging him to ferry the dead in this boat in which you ferry the gods. Then the tone got dark. If you fail, they would warn the ferryman, the dead pharaoh would leap and sit on the wing of Thoth, a god with unlimited power in the underworld who would make the ferryman suffer for not doing his job. Crossing through the twelve gates. Getting through Duet wasn't easy. Before an Egyptian soul could make its way to the paradise of Aru, it would have to cross through twelve gates. Each one had a guardian, and each guardian had to be appeased if you were to get across. That wasn't easy, though, and if a soul died in Duet, it was destroyed forever. Priests wrote guides on how to pass through, warning the living of the dangers they would face in Duet. At one doorway, they warned, they would find two beautiful women waiting for them, who would say, Come, we wish to kiss you. The dead soul would have to show he recognized them for the gods they were and call them by their names, Isis and Nephthys. Otherwise, they would cut off his nose and his lips. Every gate had a guardian, each one with its own cruel way of destroying souls. Before entering the gate that led to the desert land ruled by the God Seeker, for example, the dead soul would have to create an image of the God that ruled over it. Otherwise, his soul would be hacked into pieces. The Sealed Thing At the end of his journey, the Egyptians knew, he would be judged by the gods. Only the worthy would be allowed to move on to paradise, but if you weren't worthy, there was another way to become immortal. At the boundaries of the sky, the Egyptians believed, there was a land called Rosetown. This was the place where the god Osiris's body had been buried. Anyone who could reach it, 
they believed, would gain eternal life. Getting to Osiris's body, though, wasn't easy. His corpse was in a land of complete darkness surrounded by a wall of fire, locked inside something that they only called, the sealed thing. The Egyptian priests warned the living that this path to immortality was far too dangerous. Nobody, they said, had ever made it close enough to see inside. Cannibalizing the gods As terrifying as do it was for a commoner, most of the pharaohs weren't too worried about it. They felt entitled to eternal life. They were destined to become gods, they believed. They weren't scared of other gods. In fact, some pharaohs threatened the gods before death. When Pharaoh Eunice died, he had his priests chant to the gods that they needed to watch out. Eunice was coming, the pharaohs promised, and he was going to tie them down and eat them. Eunice is he who eats men and feeds on gods, the priests warned the gods. The early pharaohs believed that eating the gods would let them absorb their magical powers. Some of them were pretty confident they could pull that off, and nobody more so than Eunice. Eunice's grave is full of warnings, telling the gods that if they didn't want to get eaten, they'd have to pin down their friends and help carve them up for him. The Weighing of the Heart If a soul could make it through do it without being thrown into the fire, it would get its chance to be judged worthy of paradise. The soul would come face to face with Osiris, the undead lord of the underworld. Before their god, the Egyptians would have to swear that they had not broken the divine laws. Then their hearts were weighed against the feather of the goddess Maat. If the soul was innocent, he would be allowed to move on to Aru, the field of paradise. A servant might be allowed to live out eternity in a world of abundance, while a pharaoh might be allowed to become a god. But if the heart was unworthy, the dead man's soul would be thrown to a beast called Amit, the devourer. Amit would torture them, tear them apart, throw them in the fire, and cast their souls into oblivion. Even after surviving the long, dangerous journey through do it, it could all be for nothing. Nothing about the paradise on the other side was guaranteed. No matter how diligently a soul fought, it could all still end with its destruction. Norse Helheim, in Norse mythology, is a significant realm among the Nine Worlds. It serves as the abode of the dead and is governed by the enigmatic goddess Hel. Situated in the lowest level of the Norse cosmos, Nivelheim, Helheim is described as a desolate, mist-covered expanse characterized by perpetual cold and darkness. This is where individuals who did not meet death in battle or were not chosen by Odin to reside in Valhalla ultimately find themselves. The name Helheim is rooted in Old Norse, signifying the House of Hell. Interestingly, it is also believed to be the linguistic origin of the English word Hell, although the two concepts bear distinct meanings. Helheim does not serve as a place of torment or punishment, rather, it is a realm where the deceased repose in eternity. According to Norse creation myths, Helheim was brought into existence through the actions of the god Odin and his siblings, Vili and Vi. They fashioned the world following the slaying of the giant Emer, utilizing his corporeal remains to shape the earth, sea, and sky. In this process, they also formed the nine worlds, including the realm of Helheim. It is surrounded by the Slid, a river of knives, and watched over by the giantess Hela, progeny of Loki and the goddess Angoboda. In Helheim, the goddess Hela is tasked with adjudicating the fate of the departed. Those who pass away due to old age or illness are believed to find solace in Helheim, resting peacefully. Conversely, those who meet their end in combat are ushered to Valhalla, where they shall fight alongside the gods during the apocalyptic event known as Ragnarok. Hel, the enigmatic ruler of Helheim, is the offspring of the notorious trickster god Loki and the formidable giantess Angoboda. Born in Jotunheim, the foreboding realm of the giants, Hel shares parentage with her equally infamous siblings, the colossal sea serpent Jormungandr and the formidable wolf Fenrir. 
Her unusual appearance, depicting half a beautiful woman and half a decaying corpse, reflects her dual heritage as both a goddess and a Jotun giantess. This duality mirrors the mixed nature of her realm, a place that encompasses both the living and the deceased. To isolate Loki's potentially destructive offspring, Odin orchestrated their banishment to separate realms. Jormungandr was cast into the ocean surrounding Midgard, while Fenrir was bound to a desolate island. Hel, meanwhile, was appointed as the goddess presiding over the underworld in Nibelheim. There, she wielded authority over the despondent subterranean realm that subsequently took on her name, Helheim, literally translating to the, Home of Hel. In Norse cosmology, several diverse realms were conceived as the afterlife destinations for departed souls. Notable among them was Valhalla, a majestic hall overseen by Odin, where valiant warriors who met their end in battle feasted and fought for all eternity. Another warrior's realm was Folkvangr, denoted as the Field of the People, under the rule of the goddess Freya in Asgard. Additionally, Helgifjell, meaning the Holy Mountain, was presumed to be a more serene realm where the deceased continued their existence much as they did in life. Other realms tied to death and the afterlife encompassed Ran, a watery domain governed by the sea goddess Ran, where those who met their demise by drowning became constituents of her frigid, submerged dominion. The darkest and most infernal locale was Nastrand, the corpse shore, located within Helheim itself, where the malevolent were subject to torment after death. Helheim's spatial positioning in the cosmic arrangement situated it below and northward from the other worlds, nestled deep beneath the roots of Yggdrasil, the colossal tree that anchored the nine realms together. To access Helheim, souls embarked on a perilous journey, descending Yggdrasil, traversing the threshold of Helgrind, the gateway to the underworld, passing the formidable Helhound Garm, and crossing the river Jol via the Jalabru Bridge. Jol was vividly depicted as a turbulent torrent teeming with clashing weapons, emphasizing the daunting nature of the pilgrimage to Helheim. Within Helheim, one also encounters Nastrand, signifying the corpse shore, widely regarded as the most infernal precinct. In this shadowed, noisome hall overlooking the subterranean river, the dragon Nidhogg devours the remains of the wicked and oathbreakers. Presumably, those of greater virtue find repose in more pleasant environs within the dominion of Hel. According to Norse mythology, once a soul ventured into the bounds of Helheim, there was no turning back, no escape from the realm of the deceased. Helheim was portrayed as utterly isolated, severed from the other worlds by a blend of physical and mystical barriers. The solitary method of traversal was via the Jalabru, the bridge over Joel, guarded by entities like the giantess Madga, who stood as an insurmountable sentinel against all but the most deserving. Even more daunting was the formidable gate Helgrind, watched over by the monstrous hound Garm, prepared to violently rend asunder any living entity daring to traverse into Helheim. Attempting to enter Hel's dominion without her consent was tantamount to certain annihilation. Thus, whether destitute or distinguished, mortal or deity, none could evade the clutches of Hel once consigned to her realm. Solely the cataclysmic events of Ragnarok foretold the eventual vacating of Helheim, when Loki and Hel would lead their host of the deceased out of the underworld to confront the gods. Until then, no soul would depart the inhospitable bounds of Hel's mist-shrouded halls. Greek As a spectator observing a soul's journey into the Greek underworld, you would witness a transformation from the living world into a realm of shadows and ethereal beauty. The Transition Point The scene would begin at the boundary between the worlds, marked by the mystical river Styx. Here, the atmosphere shifts, and a sense of solemnity envelopes the surroundings. The air feels denser, as if carrying the weight of ages. Crossing the Styx The soul, guided by Sharon, the ferryman, embarks on a boat journey across the quiet, dark waters of the Styx. The boat glides smoothly, leaving ripples that shimmer with an otherworldly glow. Arrival in the Fields of Asphodel 
Upon reaching the shore, the soul steps onto the fields of asphodel. Here, the landscape extends into a vast, featureless plain. Tall, pale grasses sway gently in a cool, ghostly breeze, casting long, graceful shadows. The Whispering Winds Soft, echoing whispers fill the air, as if carried by invisible voices. These murmurs are the collective sighs and stories of countless souls who have passed through this realm. Glimpses of Elysium and Tartarus In the distance, one can catch glimpses of other realms within the underworld. The golden glow of Elysium, a paradise reserved for heroes, contrasts sharply with the dark chasm of Tartarus, a place of torment for the most wicked. The Palace of Hades Far on the horizon, the regal palace of Hades looms, its dark walls adorned with precious stones. The architecture carries an air of austere grandeur, a testament to the ruler of this domain. Cerberus Vigil At the entrance to the palace, Cerberus stands guard, a formidable sentinel with three heads and piercing eyes. Its presence adds a solemn gravity to the scene, emphasizing the sanctity of this realm. The River Lethe Near the palace, the River Lethe meanders, its waters whispering stories of forgotten memories. Souls approach, their footsteps echoing softly on the pebbled shores as they consider their next steps. Wisps of Ethereal Mist Delicate mists weave through the air, adding a surreal, dreamlike quality to the surroundings. They dance and swirl, creating a mystical, ever-changing tapestry. Ghostly apparitions Ghostly figures, barely discernible, move in the distance. Some are lost in contemplation, while others seem to wander with purpose, their presence ethereal yet palpable. Echoes of Voices the echoes of voices intensify, harmonizing into a haunting, melodic symphony. Each note carries the weight of stories, experiences, and emotions that have shaped the soul's journeys. As a spectator, you would find yourself immersed in a place of profound beauty and solemnity, a realm where time seems to stand still, and the boundaries between the living and the departed blur in the gentle embrace of the shadows. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel.